Well, folks, could I give you all a very warm welcome to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church for our meetings today. We're glad to see you both upstairs and down, both young and old and visitors and those who have joined with us. And if you're here for the first time, if you're visiting with us, we warmly welcome you all in our Saviour's name. And also to those that listen on the World Wide Web, whether it's the social media platforms of uh, Sermon Audio, Facebook, or YouTube, wherever you're listening and wherever you are today across the world, we warmly welcome you. We know we do have some uh, good people in the online community and very faithful. Some rise very early in the morning. I don't know what time it is with you, but you did communicate with us to say you rise very early in the morning. And many of you prepare for the Lord's Day by joining in with our service here. So we warmly welcome you, whether you're here in the province or in the United Kingdom or Europe or across the world, wherever you are tuning in, we want to thank you and trust the Lord will bless us today and he'll bless God's servant as he comes to minister the word. Before we commence our service, I would like just to say a word of thanks to all who helped yesterday, uh, the Youth Fellowship, the Friday night meeting. Uh, we're taken down to Dublin yesterday to the zoo and uh, the planning, the organising and the arranging uh, was tremendous and we have to pay tribute to Norman and to Hazel and to the team. I hope I don't leave anybody out but uh, to Suzanne and Lydia and to James and Kyle and Laura and many others as well who helped and we know that folks gave gifts for that day and there was a lot of preparation went in. A fantastic day yesterday at the zoo. And uh, we joked among ourselves that Norman and I had to keep moving because they were stock taking yesterday and they didn't want to include us in the rare breed section. Uh, but we want to thank all who uh, were with us. We had a tremendous day and the young people uh, were excited to say the least. And uh, many of them were saying to Norman, Norman, don't forget now, you'll not forget us. They were standing out on the street at about half past seven yesterday morning. Uh, there was others couldn't sleep. And that's the adults, by the way. Uh, and we had a blessed time, we have to say that. A really good day, the weather, the fellowship, everything about yesterday was just of the Lord. And uh, the Lord was with us. And we know you were praying for us. And we want to thank you for that. And uh, tired as we are, yet what a blessed day we had. So thanks to one and all, and especially to Norman. He's the right man to have around the place. He's, he's an all-rounder, as we would say. He's a first aider, an organizer, and he's everything. And he certainly put the effort in yesterday. And he got the result, and the Lord certainly blessed. So we give thanks to the Lord. And we acknowledge God's goodness and we thank our young people for making the effort to come. I think that the bus was full, about 52 at least. When we were on the bus, as one uh, was unwell, wasn't able to make it. But we're glad that the Lord was with us and he has richly blessed us. Let's turn, if you have your hymn book or else we'll see the words on screen, to the hymn 438. Uh, o pilgrim bound for the heavenly land, never lose sight of Jesus.
Praise the Lord. We're going to still our hearts for a few moments in the place of prayer. Just having a look around as we were singing, see some visitors in with us. We have welcomed you all and we're glad to see you. We'd like to welcome uh, as well as our brother Reverend Cranston, his wife Doreen. I also see Tini and Helen in as well. I see Pastor Peter Craig at the back. I would ask you up, brother, to pray, but he has had an operation on his knee. I'm not sure he was able to make the stirs, but I doubt it. But we're glad to see our brother Peter in as well. Trust the Lord will bless you and give you a full recovery and give you a touch from himself. So we're all, uh, we're glad to see you all and we warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name. Father, we thank thee once again uh, for the sentiments of this great hymn. We think of Johnson Oatman Jr. And Lord, he, an individual who lived in the shadow of his father. And Lord, could neither preach nor sing. And yet, Lord, he has left us a legacy, given us great hymns like... O pilgrim bound for the heavenly land, never lose sight of Jesus. Think of that other great hymn he penned uh, when he spoke about there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. We think, Lord, of that great gospel hymn that he has given as a legacy to the church. And Lord, I'm depending on the blood. We think of that inspirational hymn for believers and pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And yet, Lord, we think of these great hymns, but his masterpiece it must be, we believe, that great hymn, when upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. And we thank thee for those who have written these great spiritual poems and hymns and songs and gifted them to the church. And Lord, we can lift them as a prayer of worship, praise and thanksgiving to thee. And we can truthfully say, O pilgrim bound for the heavenly land, never lose sight of Jesus. Lord, so easy to get our eyes off the Lord. So easy like Peter, Lord, to look at the wind and the waves, boisterous and to think, O God, of our own, Lord, unbelievable and then fall down into the depths of despair. But we thank thee, the Lord's at hand, uh, to reach out that hand and to lift us again and bring us into the boat. And Lord, we thank thee that you will lead us gently with loving hand. Therefore, we're not to lose sight of Jesus. Lord, we pray that day and night, Lord, we will lead us right, never lose sight of Jesus. So Lord, we pray that we might Take the exhortation of the Apostle Paul when he spoke to Hebrew believers and said that we are to look on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And Lord, we despair, O God, as we look around, when we see the world in which we live, when we see, O God, such sinfulness and wickedness all around us, when we think, Lord, of little ones growing up and the little lambs of this flock in such a wicked and sinful and, Lord, evil world. And yet, Lord, we thank and praise thee that our God is still on the throne and our gaze is upward. It's heavenward. It's Godward. And like Stephen, we see Jesus at the right hand of the Father. We see our Redeemer. We see our Savior today. We see the one who bears the marks of Calvary, the one who suffered and bled and died, the just for us, the unjust, to bring us to God. We see one at thy right hand who is the only mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We thank thee for our blessed Saviour today, for thine only begotten and well-beloved Son. We thank thee for the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Lord Jesus Christ, we worship thee as God and as our Saviour and Redeemer, as our Mediator, High Priest, as our Shepherd, as our Lord, our God and our King. And we bow before thee and we give thee praise and honour and glory. We thank thee for salvation today. We thank thee for the price that thou was willing to pay. We thank thee that God veiled in human flesh, and gave himself to untold sorrow and suffering at Calvary. There he laid down his life, a ransom price for sin. We thank thee for the shedding of his crimson, ruby, redeeming and royal blood. We thank thee for the blood that was shed. We thank thee for the work that was finished. We rejoice in the sacrifice he offered and we bless thee, our Father and God, that death could not keep its prey. He tore the bars away and up from the grave he arose. He's alive forevermore. We thank thee He's exalted 
exalted to thy right hand, a prince and a saviour. And one day he will return again to this earth. But until then, he is building his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we rejoice, O God, that even as we pray, as we worship, as we gather, lively stones are being added in to that great edifice of the temple of God. And the body of Christ, O God, will never be destroyed. We thank thee, O God, that the church has foundations that can never be shaken. And we rejoice, O God, there's no election, there's no legislation, there's no parliament could ever destroy the church. We thank thee that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we rejoice, O God, that church being all born-again believers, the body of Christ on earth and in heaven. And we lift our hearts today for those in this meeting house and in this land and this nation and throughout this earth who can read their titles clear to mansions in the sky. We thank thee for that day in their experience when they knelt as sinners before the Lord, when they confessed their sin, repented of it, and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and were saved. And we thank thee, O God, and praise thee for our own salvation today. Lord, I say thank you for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for redeeming my life from destruction and crowning me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Lord, we are, like Jacob, not worthy of the least of thy mercies. And yet how good is the God we adore. Lord, you've been kind and benevolent and compassionate to us. You've been good, and the Lord is always good. We worship thee. We acknowledge thee as the true and the living God. We worship thee in the trinity of thy sacred persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank thee for the temporal and spiritual blessings bestowed upon us for civil and religious liberty. We thank thee for our English Bible, so great salvation. We thank thee for food and clothing, warmth and shelter, health and strength. We thank thee, Lord, for the use of all our faculties and the several abilities bestowed upon us. Thank thee for our church family. We thank thee, Lord, for the little ones and the little lambs of the flock. We thank thee for our young people. We thank Thank thee, Lord, for our adults and for parents and grandparents. We thank thee, Lord, for our seniors. We rejoice, O God, in the body of Christ here in the fellowship in Cumber. And we thank thee, O God, for our sisters and our brothers across the land. We thank thee for many outside our own denomination who are faithful to the blood and book. And we pray, O God, that this day will be a high day in Zion. And the word of the Lord will be precious. And we will know the blessing of God upon our hearts. So be with us now and encourage our souls, we pray. Bless and meet the need of every single individual. We think of individuals. We think of family units. We think, O oh God, of children, young people. We pray, O oh God, that you remember us today. Look upon our hearts, we beseech thee. Thou knowest our state before thee, where we stand with God. Lord, whether we're saved, whether we're unsaved, whether we're in Christ or out of Christ, whether it's well with our soul or we're still in our sin, whether we're heaven bound or on the broad road that leads to destruction. Thou knowest, O oh God, the spiritual state now whether, Lord, we're walking close to thee, whether we're afar off as thy children, whether we're separated by sin as a sinner, thou knowest. And we pray, O God, you'll look today upon the heart. Lord, we can only look in the outward appearance and we would make the wrong judgment. We would be way off the mark. And Lord, thou, O God, lookest upon the heart and we open our hearts to thee today. We invite thee to come and to examine us today and to search us, O God, and to make us clean and whole and to wash away our sins sin and the precious blood of the Lamb and then to infill us with the Holy Spirit of promise that we might worship thee in spirit and in truth and know the blessing of God upon us and we cry unto thee for a gracious move of thy spirit in these days we pray O God that our land our land O God that we fear is departing from God by the tens of thousands they're turning their back upon thee and thy law and we cry out to God for a breath of revival we pray for a move of the spirit we realize O God that there's no uh, political or Lord religious fix that will ever Lord better this country we realize oh God nothing short of revival uh, will make the difference and we cry unto thee that we might put our energy and put our prayers oh God and our efforts into seeking thy face calling upon thee confessing our sin and the sin of our land and the turning of the people back to God we pray oh God whether it's Roman Catholic or Protestant or other no matter who they are we're sinners in thy sight. They need salvation. They need to get right with God. And Lord, it matters little whether we're, Lord, well, Lord, economically, politically, or religiously. It matters nothing when it comes to the soul. The, the soul, O oh God, could live in prosperity and could have everything it needed and yet never be saved. 
lost in hell, perishing, Lord, languishing in torment. Have mercy, we pray, upon the lost. Lord, we wouldn't cross the street to make them free Presbyterian. We'd go to the ends of the earth to point them to the only Savior, the Christ of God. And we pray for a rescue mission. We pray you'll bless the efforts of all who labor in the gospel. And bless thy servant today as he comes to preach the word. And we pray you prepare our hearts, Lord, to hear that word. And loving Father, we pray that all things Christ will be honored and glorified. Continue with us now. And loving Father, in answer to prayer, glorify thy dear Son. Remember especially those who mourn today. We're not unmindful of the sick today. We just bring them to thee. We pray especially, Lord, for Owen McCartney. We pray for Gladys. And Lord, he's going through the valley. And we thank thee he's saved. And he knows the Lord. We pray you'll comfort Gladys and you'll be with her. We pray too for John Hamilton. Not one bit well. Lord, remember Gemma and the whole family. We lovingly bring them again to thee. We pray, Lord, for Harry Willis. We thank thee for thy hand upon him. Lord, even during that accident, and we just pray for him. And we pray you'll be with him and Jill, his wife, or his mother, rather. And we pray, Lord, you'll draw near. Remember, Lord, Diane and Bran Ernie. Remember, Lord, especially her sister, Yvonne Spence. We pray for their full recovery. We pray for Betty as she prepares herself for surgery. We pray you'll be with her and undertake for her. So we bring these dear ones, and there are many others, Lord, who need prayer today, all to thee. We spread them before the Lord and pray especially for these individuals that you will draw near. Remember our sister Frances Hunsdale, undertake for her too. We leave them all with thee now, in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen and amen. I'll ask our clerk of session, Mr. Jackie Allister, if you come forward, please. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Well, as always, I want to add my words of welcome to all of you who have been able to gather out with us this morning in the Lord's house. Good to see you all, uh, those who are regulars and those who are perhaps visiting. You're especially welcome as well. Of course, to Reverend Cranston, it is good to have him back with us, uh, back in the midst here. He's no stranger, really, in this part of the province. I know his many connections here, but it is good to have our brother with us again. Do you remember uh, that uh, we're taking up our missionary offering today, and that offering will be going towards the work of the Missionary Council of our denomination. Uh, there are designated baskets there for the missionary offering and other baskets for the normal giving. Uh, so do just uh, take note of where uh, you want to place your offering this morning. Uh, then in the afternoon, 3 p.m., uh, God willing, we'll be going out into the open air again, uh, and our the venue this afternoon uh, will be Cherry Valley, uh, and weather looks good and set fair, uh, so we do encourage as many as possible uh, to be out with us uh, to stand for the Lord uh, in the open air this afternoon. We remember the gospel service this evening, 7 p.m., our own minister, Reverend Martin, will be with us. And of course, do remember the season of prayer from half past six uh, beforehand uh, for that meeting. Uh, young folks as well, remember the young adults uh, fellowship meeting uh, for local churches in this area. Uh, this month it is in Carrie Duff, so over there tonight at 8.45 p.m. Uh, then on Tuesday evening, 8 p.m., our prayer meeting, go ahead as usual. Uh, Friday, 11.30 a.m. is our seniors meeting, that monthly meeting that we have. And of course, we get uh, lunch afterwards, so that's something to encourage you to come. Uh, the speaker this week, is, uh, this uh, month, will be Mr. Lloyd Watson. Uh, and of course, uh, if you would, just if you're able to come, if you'd add your name to the list there in the porch of the church, uh, just to give an idea for catering numbers. Uh, then Friday evening, 10 p.m., our men's prayer meeting as normal. Next Lord's Day, the Sunday school and Bible class at a quarter past 10. The two services, half past 11 and 7 p.m. 
and God willing, the Reverend Martin will be with us for those services next Lord's Day. I remember, of course, the seasons of prayer as well. And of course, uh, we will be having our open air weather permitting as well in the afternoon. Uh, can I mention as well, uh, it's already started, this mission vision. Uh, the cards are there in the hall. I see a good number have gone. Uh, but each night that started yesterday runs right through to the next uh, Saturday. And each we uh, evening is a different speaker, different subject. Pick up the little card, you'll see that there. And the uh, meetings are at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, each evening during the week. Uh, can I mention as well that the new issue of the Vision magazine is available, uh, so you can take that with you as you leave uh, this morning. Can I mention as well that uh, somebody left uh, their glasses behind, I think it was two weeks ago, I forgot to mention that last week, but they're still here, and if you left your glasses behind, they will be out sitting in a little uh, ledge out there uh, in the hall of the church as you leave. Thank you. I'd like to thank our brother very much indeed for making those announcements, subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Let's turn again in our hymn books or on screen to the hymn 440, Teach Me Thy Way, O Lord, Teach Me Thy Way. back to hymn books very shortly, believe me. <laughs> Technology. Only one job to do, one button, just one finger. <laughs> I'm really joking. Shows you just don't know the hymns as well as we think. Folks, I'd like just to say on a very personal note that it is a joy and a privilege to have in the, the pulpit here with me the Reverend Reggie Cranston and also to welcome his wife Doreen. Uh, they are dear friends of ours and our family. Uh, I have known our brother Reggie from the early 1980s. Uh, he came in uh, like a telly boy into the Mays prison. And uh, his first introduction to us was that he shared his testimony. And uh, we were in a little room, and I mean a room about maybe less than half the size of the prayer room that we met in upstairs in the hall. And our brother didn't hold back, and he has this bell tone voice and it just reverberated around those walls, and he nearly burst our eardrums, and we were sitting there in absolute fear and terror of this man. And when we looked at him, he's the same weight as he was then, 
as he is now. Not a pick on him. And uh, we often wondered, where does that sound come from? Where does it come from? But I will say this, that after I heard him testify and preach, uh, my spirit knitted with his spirit. And just like David and Jonathan, a friendship was formed uh, that has lasted right through to this very hour. Amen. I've had the privilege of sharing with him in his own pulpit in Port Hope. Uh, I've had the privilege of kneeling with him in the little room in Port Hope, and we prayed for ours, and we broke our hearts before God, and our brother is on our prayer list. And uh, there's one person I would love to have had with us today, and that is our brother Reggie Hamilton. Uh, Reggie's not well. A soul winner. And a stalwart for God. Amen. And if everybody ever knew Reggie Hamilton, he's a walking Bible. And he doesn't know the theology that he has. He just talks the Lord. He introduces the Bible into everything without even knowing it. He's a unique individual. He's not well, not able to make it. And he would love to be here today. And we miss him dearly. And we trust the Lord will be with him. And give him grace and help. We're glad that Helen and Tini are here. And uh, we know that Reggie's here in spirit. But be not in body. But we're, we're thankful to the Lord. So we, without further ado, get that word right. Uh, we're going to invite our brother now to come and to preach the word of the Lord to us. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Reverend Martin for his words of welcome. First of all, for the invitation to come and minister the word today. I do remember those days very vividly in the Mayor's prison. I've often told the story that when I went there for the first time, I didn't know how to introduce myself and get used to the men. And uh, so I thought I'll give, my, I'll give a word of testimony. So I gave my testimony and I talked about the night I got saved. And I said I left the church there in Tandragi. And I was walking down the laneway, and I was so happy. I said, the dandelions look like orange lilies. <laughs> and one of the prisoners, he jumped up, and he said, boy, that's a cracker. <laughs> so that sort of broke the ice. And uh, we do rejoice in the friendship we forged with your minister ever since then. So I appreciate his invitation to come a minister the word here today, and I would like to take the opportunity to bring you greetings from our work in Port Hope, Ontario. As your minister said, we had him out in Port Hope. Minister too is there. Port Hope is a small town. For instance, Toronto, which is 60 miles from Port Hope, has a population of four and a half million. Port Hope has a population of about 16, 18,000. And uh, certainly the number and attendance reflects that. We've been there, it's hard to believe, being in Port Hope with my wife and family now for 29 years. And it certainly doesn't seem that length of time since we left Newton Abbey and responding to the call of the Lord and going out to Canada. So we bring you greetings from our work there in Port Hope. And as I say, it's a small work, it always has been. You get people that'll come and they'll tell you how, oh, this, this is the church we've been looking for for years. And then after a couple of years, they're gone. And uh, you get those encouragements and then the discouragements whenever they depart from us. But anyway, we're glad to be here back in Ulster once more. We return to Port Hope, Lord willing, on Tuesday. We're finishing off here in in Ulster tonight, in Newton Abbey, my former congregation. I'm in, I'm in Ulster because Bellamina Church invited me to preach a week of meetings there, and uh, then have an opportunity to preach around some of our other congregations. And so it's a joy to be here, and I do thank Tina and uh, Helen for coming today also. They're dear friends of us as well, and we do miss badly our brother Mr. Reggie Hamilton, and a great man of God, and uh, he's just very down on us. I do remember him 
please, in your prayers. I'd like you to turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Mark. Mark's Gospel in the chapter 15. Mark 15. And we'll commence our reading at verse 39. Mark 15 and verse 39. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the less and of Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. Regarding the words of that verse 41, you can go over some time and look at the opening verses of Luke chapter 8. It's the reference to the same women. They followed the Lord from Galilee to Jerusalem. That's a distance of over 100 miles. And they followed Christ and they ministered unto him of their own substance. And they, as it were, took care of the Savior as he went from Galilee through many a town and village. And they followed him all the way and ministered unto him of their own substance. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling on to him, the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone onto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, beheld where he was led. Amen. Pray the Lord will be pleased to add his blessing to the public reading of his own holy, infallible, and inerrant word. With God's word open before us now, let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray over the word that the Lord will be pleased to speak to us from his precious word today. Let us pray. Eternal Father and gracious and loving God, we by humbly in thy holy presence, conscious that we are in the presence of the thrice holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, O Lord, thou hast said to be still and know that thou art God. And we pray, Lord, thou wilt still our hearts even now. And, O Lord, we pray that today, this morning, we will be listening for the voice of our Savior. Whether that voice comes to us as the sound of many waters, or we hear it as that still small voice, 
Lord, we would say with one of old, speak, for thy servant heareth. Lord, come and abide with us now, I pray. I ask, O Lord, that thou would grant to me the help and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The Lord, I might be enabled to preach the word. And in preaching the word, I will always preach Christ. Speak well of him, his finished work, and his precious shed blood. Come, Lord, and abide with us now, I pray. In the Savior's wonderful name, we ask all these things. Amen. Mark chapter 15, and our text for this morning, is that verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. Everything that surrounded the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was purposely designed by his enemies to aggravate and exaggerate his humiliation. The insults from the soldiers, the rabble who gathered there, and the rulers, the scourging, the buffeting, the spittles, the mockings by all who gathered around that cross, the mock robe, the taking of the rod, and the tense of the word there tells us, they took the rod and they smote him on the head. Not once, but they smote him again and again and again and again. Think of standing there and beholding that scene, smiting the Lord across the mouth, standing, spitting upon him, going over and pulling the hair of his face. And not a word. Not a word of complaint. As a sheep before his shearers, he was dumb. Now that the Savior had been crucified and had given up the ghost, what was to be done with his body? I want you to notice something. None of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, none of them, in dealing with the cross, none of them say the Lord Jesus died. None of them. Each one tells us that the Lord gave up the ghost. The Lord gave up the spirit. None of them say he died. That tells us that the Lord Jesus did not die as a martyr. Listen. Those Roman soldiers did not take the life of Christ from him. The Lord Jesus laid down his life. The Lord Jesus surrendered his life. He had power to lay it down and he had power to take it up again. I'll tell you something more. The dear Savior chose the hour and the moment 
when he would give up the ghost. The dear Savior was in control of all things there on Calvary. He laid down his life. Does not bring it home to his believer. As I said, he didn't die as a martyr. His life wasn't taken from him. He laid it down of himself. Why? For you and me. He laid down his life for you and me. It wasn't taken from him. But now that he has laid down his life at a time of his own choosing, what was to be done with his lifeless frame? The Romans' custom was to let the bodies of the crucified to rot on the crosses where they had been crucified. That was the Roman custom. Just let them hang there and let the bodies decompose. And the scavenging birds come and feed on those bodies. That was the Roman custom. You turn, please, to Deuteronomy. In chapter 21, Deuteronomy 21, and there we read in verse 22, this was God's law. Deuteronomy 21, verse 22, and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, Listen, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy hand, land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. He that is hanged upon a tree is accursed of God. The Lord Jesus was hanged on a tree. And the Lord Jesus was cursed of God. Why? Because he was made sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But mark the words. He was made sin for us. No. He wasn't just made a sinner. The Lord Jesus was made sin. He was made sin. If you like, the Lord Jesus was sin personified. He was made sin. Our sins were imputed to him. And all the sins of his elect were imputed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus was made sin for us. And because of that, the curse of God was upon him. It's important to get that into our minds and into our hearts. The great cost, the great price of our salvation. That he who knew no sin, who was holy, harmless, undefiled and separate from sinners was made sin for us. 
and he was hanged upon a tree. And as he hung upon that tree, the, the curse of the Lord Jehovah was upon him, was upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But what was to be done with him? It was probable that the body of the Lord Jesus would have been, would have been put in a common grave somewhere with those who had been crucified with him. But providentially, providentially, that was prevented when into view came a man called Joseph of Arimathea. This man would take the body of Christ and give that body an honorable burial. But what do we know about Joseph of Arimathea? He is not mentioned anywhere in Scripture until he appeared to take the body of Christ and bury it. He's not mentioned before it, and he's not mentioned after it. This is his only appearance in all of Scripture. But I'll tell you something. This man, Joseph of Arimathea, has much to teach us. He has much to teach us. He is one of the lesser knowns of Scripture. And he certainly deserves our attention. So let us look at this man, Joseph of Arimathea. One, first of all, to notice the person. The person who buried the Lord. We're introduced to that person here in verse 43. Notice, we might read verse 42. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation that is the day before the Sabbath, verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, he just appears on the scene suddenly. We're not introduced to him in any way. You read verse 42 and verse 43 begins, Joseph of Arimathea. There you have his appearance. His appearance upon the scene was certainly very sudden. In Luke 23 and verse 50, there we read there, there are two words in italics which tell us they're not in the original. And so that may be read, Roman 23, verse 50, or Luke 23, verse 50. And behold, a man named Joseph. Behold, a man named Joseph. There's just a sudden appearance, no introduction. But what I notice about this man and his appearance is, first of all, he was a chosen man. That's right. Joseph of Arimathea was chosen by God to bury God's son. Matthew tells us, Matthew 27, verse 57, when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph. Those are important words. There came a rich man called Joseph. Because those words bring us back to the Old Testament and into the book of Isaiah and Isaiah 53 and verse 9. And what do we read there? And he made his grave with the wicked, the malefactors. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich. 
in his death. And so there, away back 450 or so years before, a rich man is mentioned in relation to the death of Christ. No other rich man is found in relation to the death and burial of Christ but Joseph of Arimathea. What does that tell us? It tells us that God had chosen Joseph of Arimathea to be the man that would go into Pilate, claim the body of Christ, and give it a decent burial. 450 or so years before, we read about Joseph of Arimathea as the rich man. No other rich man was associated with claiming the body of the Lord Jesus. He was chosen of God. Not only was he a chosen man, he was what we might describe as a close by man. He was close by. He was there at the scene. Joseph was close enough to see what was taking place. Close enough to take the body of Christ and bury it. Since God had chosen Joseph to care for the body of the Savior, providentially Joseph was right there. Right there. Isn't that interesting? He was right there where the Lord was able to use him. He was close by. He could have been in Arimathea, the city of the Jews. He could have been anywhere, but he wasn't. He was right there. He was close by the Lord. We want to be used by the Lord. We need to be close by him. You can't expect to serve the Lord and be used by the Lord if, like Peter, you're following him afar off. Need to be close by. Remember that day the Lord fed the 5,000? Plus women and children. And you remember what he, what he said to the disciples? He challenged the disciples how the multitude was going to be fed. And they had a very simplistic answer. They said, send them away. Well, we know the Lord has never sent anybody away empty. Lord has never sent anyone away disappointed. And just as that, Andrew came to the Lord and said, there is a lad here. Mark the words. There is a lad here. He's right here. He's beside us, Lord. Andrew is saying, Lord, there is a lad right here. And we know how the Lord used that lad of the, what he had, the five barley loaves and the two small fishes. He was right there beside the Lord. Are we living close to the Lord? How close are we to our Savior? Can we say, I'm right there, I'm right beside the Lord, I'm right there. The Lord can use me any time. There is a lad here. And Joseph of Arimathea, he was right here. And the Lord used Joseph that day. As well as his appearance, you have his allegiance. Matthew tells us that he was Jesus' disciple. Matthew 27, verse 57. <coughs> so Matthew tells us 
He was a disciple of the Lord. But then John tells us in John 19, verse 38, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. He was a secret disciple. He was a follower of Christ, but he didn't want anybody to know. The word secretly means to hide. And really, not only was Joseph of Arimathea hiding the fact that he was the Lord's disciple, I feel it went further than that. Not just hiding the fact he was the Lord's disciple, but as far as he was concerned, he was hiding the Lord himself in his life. Didn't want anybody to know he was a follower of Christ. A disciple of the Lord Jesus, but secretly. How many are like that today? Ashamed to own my Lord and to defend his cause. Here is Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple. Why? For fear of the Jews. Fear of man bringeth a snare. Peter suffered from the same complaint. Remember? When the Savior was arrested, there were those who saw Peter and they said, He is one of them. He's one of the Lord's disciples. Remember what Peter said? I know not the man. What a terrible thing. I know not the man. He didn't want anything to do with the Lord Jesus. Yeah, the fear of man bringeth a snare. Such was Joseph of Arimathea, ashamed of the Lord. Terrible, isn't it? That any disciple of Christ would be ashamed of him. Well, listen to this. Hebrews 2, verse 11. For which cause he, Christ, is not ashamed to call them brethren. It brings it home, doesn't it? The Lord Jesus, the dear Lord Jesus, is not ashamed of us. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren. Why should anybody be ashamed to call Christ their Savior? He's not ashamed of us. And you think of the sins we have committed, the times we have failed them, the times we've let him down, the times we've grieved him, and yet he says, I'm not ashamed of my brother. I'm not ashamed of you. What a wonderful Savior. His appearance, his allegiance, his attractiveness. Yes, We are told about Joseph of Arimathea that he was an attractive man. Look at verse 43 again, our text. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor. 
That word honorable, that word honorable means handsome. Not interesting. The word honorable means handsome or comely. Now, I don't believe that the reference there is to his physical appearance. It may be, but I think it is primarily to do what he was spiritually. Yes, he was a disciple of the Lord secretly, but there was a comeliness about him. There was a loveliness about him. I, I'm sure you've been with a Christian or Christians. You spend time with them and you've come away and say, you know, that's a, that's a lovely Christian. That's a lovely Christian woman. That's a lovely Christian man. Well, if we'd have been in the company of Joseph of Arimathea, that's what we would have said about him. Boy, isn't he a lovely Christian man? Isn't he a lovely individual? Turn, please, to Luke's Gospel. Chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. And verse 50. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and just. The same had not consented to the council of the Sanhedrin. Indeed, of them, he didn't consent to the arrest and the crucifixion of Christ. The same had not consented to the council and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. So there were given some more details about Joseph of Arimathea. But if you read those two verses carefully, you will find that five things are said about him. Five things are used to describe Joseph of Arimathea. He was an honorable counselor. There's one. He was a good man. There's two. He was just, there's three. He did not consent to the counsel and the deed of them, there's four. And he waited for the kingdom of God. He waited for the coming of Messiah. There's five. Now when it comes to Bible numbers, we know what the number five is. Intimates. Five is the number of grace. Five is the number of grace. And here in this man's life, we see the grace of God. No wonder he was described as a lovely man. Because he exhibited the grace of God in his life. Believer, that's what we are to do. We are to exhibit the grace of God in our lives. That others know there's a man, there's a woman who's been to Jesus for the cleansing power and they're washed in the blood of the Lamb. What a lovely thing to see the grace of God in a man or woman's life. 
And such grace was evident in the life of Joseph of Arimathea. An honorable counselor, handsome, comely, lovely. He was like Christ. Sure, what did the bride in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, say when she was asked, What is thy beloved more than another beloved, that thou dost so charge us? And she began to describe her beloved, and she was really describing Christ. And when she had exhausted her vocabulary, she finished off by saying, Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. All together lovely. And we look at Joseph of Arimathea, and we see a loveliness in him. We see the loveliness of Christ in him. Oh, that others will see the loveliness of Christ in us. And that'll be our testimony. There's a man, there's a woman that exhibits the loveliness of the Lord Jesus. We've considered Joseph the person. Want to look at Joseph and his preparation. Joseph now proceeds to make preparation for the burial of the Lord. Think of something here. Where was Peter? Where was James? Where was John? Where was Andrew? Where were those men? He had followed Christ for over three years, sat under his ministry for over three years. Where was Peter who said he would go to prison for the Lord? He would die for the Lord. Where was John? John who always addressed himself as that disciple whom Jesus loved. Where were they? Well, when the shepherd was taken, the sheep were scattered. That word scattered. Is the Greek word scandalizo. Well, we got our English word scandal. In other words, those disciples, when the Lord Jesus was arrested and they scattered, they felt it would be a scandal to be associated with him. It would be a scandal to be seen with the Lord Jesus. And when it came to burying the body of Christ, there wasn't one of them to be found. Only Joseph. Notice, regarding his preparation, notice his courage. His courage. Here we read that he went in boldly on the pilot and craved the body of Jesus, verse 43. We have just been considering Joseph a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews. But look, he has gone right into 
the room or the office or the hall of Pilate himself. He disowned the Lord because of his fear of the Jews. Not anymore. There he is. He goes right into Pilate's room and seeks the body of Christ. And you say, what, what brought about the change? He was a coward before. But he's courageous now. What, what changed him? The cross. The cross changed him. For so long, he had been a secret disciple. Kept the fact that he was a disciple of Christ to himself, ashamed of the Lord, until that day he saw his Savior hanging there upon that cinder tree. And saw what Christ did for him there. He could no longer be ashamed of him. And suddenly the man who was a coward before became a man who had great courage. The cross gave him the courage. When he saw what Christ did for him, how could he be ashamed of the Lord? And so it is with us, believer. How can we deny the Lord? How can we be ashamed of the Lord? How can we be a disciple secretly in the light of the cross? And what the dear Lord did for us there. Do you need courage to stand for the Lord? Look at the cross. Do you need courage to defend the Lord when you're in the company of the ungodly and they take the Lord's name in vain? Look at the cross. Does anyone need courage to own the Lord and to defend his cause? Look at the cross. Look to Christ on the cross. Paul said, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he did it for us believers. He did it for you and me. How can we possibly be ashamed of him? How can we possibly deny him when we need to stand up for him? As well as his courage, we notice his claim. That is, Joseph of Arimathea claimed the body of the dear Savior. Once again, there wasn't another man. Wasn't another man there to claim the body of Christ. No Peter, no John, no Andrew. Not one of them. And oh, how Joseph of Arimathea wanted that body of Christ. Listen to this. Matthew tells us that Joseph went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Begged the body of Jesus Matthew 27, 58. 
Mark here tells us he went in boldly on the pilot and craved the body of Jesus. Luke tells us, Luke 23, 52, again, he begged the body of Jesus. John, we read, Joseph besought Pilate for the body of Jesus to take him away. See all that? Begged the body of Christ. He was begging. He craved the body of Christ. It's not something. He craved his body. He craved Christ. You know if anybody has a craving for something, that craving's not satisfied until they get what they crave after. And here's Joseph of Arimathea, and he craved the body of Christ. He must have Jesus. He must have Christ. You ever felt that way? Have you ever said, I must have the Lord? I must have him to come and draw near to me and stand beside me. I want the Lord. I want him so much. When you pray, do you have that craving? You crave his wonderful presence. You must have him. But well, here's Joseph, and he must have Christ. No wonder he's described as a handsome man, a godly man, a man who exhibits the grace of God in his life. I'm not ashamed to owe my Lord or to defend his cause than to the honor of his word, the glory of his cross. I must have him. His courage, his claim, and then you have his care. Verse 46. Mark 15, now we read in verse 46, and he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulchre which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone onto the door of the sepulchre. Upon reading the words of that verse, how often have you stopped and meditated upon those words? Or have you read through that chapter and just gone on to the next chapter? And he bought fine linen and took him down all by himself. Now you think of what that meant. Think about that. For Joseph of Arimathea to take down the body of Christ, listen, he had to pull out the nails that were in his hand. You think about how difficult that would have been. And they had to pull the nails from his feet. And it says he took him down. No doubt 
He wrapped the body of Christ over his shoulder. You imagine what that was like. He had bought fine linen. You notice that? Fine linen. It was no substitute. It was fine linen. It was the best. In other words, that day when he took down the body of the Savior, he gave to Christ the best. Believer, are you giving the Lord your best? He gave the Lord, his Savior, the best. Whatever expense he incurred, no doubt Joseph knew it was worth it all, for he was doing it for Christ. Praise the Lord. It was worth it. It was worth it. Anything he would do for the Lord was worth it. You remember the previous chapter that day, the Lord entered the house of Simon, the leper. And a woman came with an alabaster box of ointment. And she broke the box. She didn't even keep the box for herself. She broke the box, poured it upon his head. In other words, she crowned Christ King of her life. And then there was that outburst of criticism. What a waste. You imagine describing what that, that woman did for her Lord, called it a waste. Carnal individuals. Anything, I tell you, anything, no matter how small, anything you do for Christ is never a waste. Never. No matter how small, it is never a waste. But here this man, Joseph of Arimathea, he gave the Lord that day his very best. Second Samuel 24, verse 24, we read, Neither will, David said, Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. David was saying, I wouldn't dare give to the Lord something that doesn't cost me anything. In other words, David was saying that would be an insult. I would be insulting the Lord. Joseph and the person, Joseph and the preparation, finally, and briefly, Joseph and his partner. John, of course, told us about that night that a man called Nicodemus came to the Lord. Came by night. Why? Because he feared the Jews. Same thing again. But lo and behold, when Joseph took down the body of the Lord, Nicodemus came and joined him. He came out of the darkness. And came out into the open and owned his Lord. Not afraid of the Jews anymore. And no doubt saying Joseph of Arimathea would have given courage to Nicodemus. You notice their deeds. We are told what Nicodemus brought, a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And they anointed the body of the Savior.
that woman who anointed the head of the Lord, when the disciples criticized her, the Lord said, let her alone. And then he went on to say, she has done what she could. That's what the Lord expects of us. To do what we can. To do what we can for Christ. Joseph of Arimathea did what he could for the Lord. His deeds and his departure. Over in Matthew 27, verse 60, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre, and departed. That's it. That's the last you read about Joseph. He did what he could for the Lord. He gave the Lord his best. And departed. You never read about him again. He'll always be remembered as a lovely man. A man who exhibited the loveliness of Christ. A man who showed forth the grace of God in his life. May the Lord make us more like Joseph of Arimathea. Better still. May the Lord make us more like Joseph's Savior. Let's bow in prayer. Oh, our dear Lord, we thank thee for these wonderful examples we find written in Scripture. As Paul said, these things are written for your learning. Lord, may we learn from Joseph today. May we, Lord, be a people who will give the Lord the best. May we be a people, Lord, who will do what we can for the Savior. May we, Lord, be a people who exhibits, shows forth the loveliness of Christ. May others see Christ in us. Lord, bless this congregation and thy servant who labors here. Be with us, Lord, as we now part one from the other. Keep thy hand upon us all for good. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide and remain with us now. And until the day breaks, and the shadows all flee away. Amen. Amen.